Shall we all arise uh, and sing a few songs to worship God? The name of the Lord be praised. The name of the Lord be honored. The name of the Lord be glorified. Hallelujah. The psalmist says in Psalm 23, and the last verse, it says like this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. The goodness and the mercy of God may dwell in our lives. Had it not been for the goodness of God, we wouldn't be standing here and praising Him. So this morning, as we are in God's presence, let's thank the Lord for His mercy, for His goodness, for His faithfulness. And that's what we're going to sing this morning. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God. It's better to be in the presence of God one day than a thousand elsewhere. How lovely is your dwelling place. O oh Lord Almighty, my soul and even faints for you.
is a one day in your courts of God than a thousand elsewhere. And that's why we are here this morning praising the Lord for who He is and what He is doing in and through our lives. Just like the psalmist says in Psalm 23, as just like I have reiterated it, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. This morning as we are in the presence of God, dwelling in the house of God, let's be praising God for who He is. Let's say this prayer. Lord, draw me close to you. Close to your presence, O oh God. I cry this morning, Lord, you are all I want. For every breath that I take and every moment that I'm awake is by your grace, O oh God. We are here to worship the Lord. We are here to declare his praises. We are here to sing how great God is. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee. 
Christ shall come. When Christ shall come. With shout of acclamation. like we've sung when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart and that's why we are living this life on this earth a blessed hope that we have Christ is going to come back soon but we got to check on ourselves are we ready to go with him and then I shall bow with humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great thou art how great thou art how great thou art. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this morning you have given in our lives. We praise you for who you are and for what you do in and through our lives, O oh God. From the mouth of infants, you have ordained praises. You are such a great God. If the infants could praise you, Lord, if the nature could declare your goodness, how much more we have to praise you, Lord the ones who have been created in the image of God. The ones on whom the love of God abounds. Lord, our prayer is that as long as we live, as long as we have breath, may we seek to praise you, Lord. May we seek to worship you. Draw us near to you, Lord draw us near to you but just like we've sung oh God you're all we want you're all that we desire oh God you're all that we seek help us to know that you are near to us oh God not only in times of prosperity but in times of troubles and difficulties as well no matter what we go through in life Lord may we experience the very presence of God in and through our lives and as we are seated in your presence, we pray that, Lord, that you would speak to us. Speak to us from your word, O oh God. That your word that is sharper than double-edged sword would pierce our hearts, O oh God. And would lead us into your path, we pray. We give you all praises, glory, and honor. For you alone deserve it, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You all may be seated, please. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord, to worship Him, 
And God has given us this opportunity, this uh, moment that we as a church could gather together in this manner to worship God. We've been looking at the Gospel of Mark. We've come to the end, uh, just two more chapters, and we are done with the Gospel of Mark. Praise be to God for his blessings in and through our lives. Last week, we looked at one of the, or two of the greatest human um, emotions, profound human emotions, that was displayed at a place called Bethany. We looked at betrayal, we looked at devotion. On one hand, you have devotion of the widow, or sorry, devotion of Mary, who came there and poured out the alabaster jar of oil at the feet of Jesus. And on the other hand, you have Judas. He wanted to betray Jesus. I have already shared the sermon outline in, the, uh, in our church group. And so you can look at the sermon outline later on. You can just look at it. It's just, uh, you know, just the bullet points that I've given uh, to add flesh to the skeleton. Uh, maybe if you can um, jot down the notes as we look at this passage. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 26, a very pivotal moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples. And we know this is a passage that is recounting the celebration, uh, the preparation of the Passover meal, which we, which we call as the Lord's Supper. This passage is very rich in symbolism. It is very rich in prophecy. It is very rich in profound spiritual significance. Now, imagine with me the streets of Jerusalem, the bustling streets of Jerusalem during this Passover festival. People from all around the world would gather in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, to commemorate the deliverance that they have received uh, from their Egyptian bondage. In midst of that historic celebration, you have Jesus preparing for his own hour of deliverance. Jesus is doing his own preparation to prepare the humankind, to prepare human beings or, or for the ultimate sacrifice that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So they're all gathered in the upper room, and you find in that gathering a moment of revelation, a moment of deep intimacy. Jesus was fully aware of the suffering that he was going to go through, and he shares a meal with some of his closest friends there. It is here in that upper room that Jesus institutes one of the cornerstone of Christian worship, that is the Lord's Supper. We participate in the Lord's Supper, and it was on that day, on that very day, Jesus inaugurated that celebration, that Christian ordinance, or the Christian worship, the cornerstone of Christian worship, known as the Lord's Supper or communion. Through the breaking of bread and, uh, and sharing of the cup, Jesus provides his disciples with a powerful reminder of the sacrifice of his love, of his faithfulness towards all of us. And also a great reminder of the new covenant that Jesus has built with us. So when we look at this passage, this morning I'm going to talk to you about the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. And in that Last Supper you find trust, you find betrayal, and you also find a new covenant that is taking place in that Last Supper. Basically it's the Last Supper, you can also call it as a First Supper. Because from there onwards, a new paradigm begins. It is the new covenant that Jesus is making with that of to celebrate this Passover. They didn't ask that. Because they knew that Jesus celebrates the Passover and he's been celebrating it. Previous years also he celebrated. So now they're asking, Lord, at this moment, at this juncture, what would be the suitable place for all of us to you know, celebrate this Passover? By the way, Lord, we do not have a house. Yes, we do. Some of us do have a house. You yourself do not have a house. And none of us have a place to settle down. So Lord, tell us which would be the ideal, which would be the suitable place for us to celebrate the Passover. Now, in our lives, we have our times of preparation. You prepare for so many things, isn't it? You have t had times of preparation. If you are choosing another career, career you, know, you have a time of preparation. You prepare for it. You are traveling from one place to the other. You have time of preparation. How many of us do inquire from God his will towards the things that we do? We, do we really seek God's guidance? Now, here we have the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, we've got to do something, and we want to ask for your will. They didn't say, Peter didn't say, Lord, I am the spokesperson of this committee, of this group, and I know it all. You know, I can do everything. He didn't say that. He is going and inquiring of the Lord. You know, in our moments of preparation, 
whether it is for a significant task or it is for a daily task, intentionally we must seek God's guidance through prayer and reading of his word. You know, when you pray, I'm, I'm not saying that God would come and whisper in your ear saying this is what you've got to do. But you can at least pray. You can at least read the word. And God would speak to us through his word. Make it a habit. As soon as you get up early in the morning to spend your time with God in prayer and asking for his will, asking for his direction for your life. Because we've got to live the entire day and we've got to have his will in the things that we are doing. So here we have the disciples going to Jesus and inquiring of him, where should we celebrate this Passover? Verses 13 to 15, we find Jesus is instructing them what they've got to do. Verses 13, let me read that for all of us. So it says like this. So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. So the disciples inquired of Jesus where we should go, and Jesus is instructing in verses 13 to 15. Now, when, when I read that passage, that, that, that instruction, it is quite reminiscent of the instruction that Jesus gave before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You remember that? The triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where they all sang, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And both these instructions carry somewhat similar, you know, sim similar observations we do have there. In both of these events, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and also the Passover celebration, you have Jesus instructing two disciples, isn't it? Over there also you had two disciples going, and here also you have two disciples. And in both these events, Jesus had foreknowledge of what is going to happen. It was not by accident. It was not by chance. Jesus knew what exactly is going to happen and his instructions how this will come to pass. And here also Jesus is knowing what exactly is going to happen, where they are going, all the knowledge about everything Jesus is having. In both the situations, there in the triumphal entry and here as well, you have, you know that it was exactly done as Jesus had said. Not an iota of change happened. Just like Jesus said, it happened exactly. You know, that's always the case. When Jesus promises, his promises are yea and amen. You can trust in his promise. Not an iota will change when he said something that truly will happen. And all of God's promises is fulfilled in Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why when we give praises to God, we know that he is able to do the things for us as he has promised for us in his word. So these two disciples, by the way, Mark is not telling who these two disciples are. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, we find, Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 8, these two disciples are Peter and John. Peter and John were these two disciples whom Jesus has sent. Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, and verses 8. You find these two men, even in Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed, these two men at the Mount of Transfiguration, these two men were always close to Jesus. Peter, James, and John, in fact, the three inner circle of Jesus. But here you have Peter and John, Peter and John, whom Jesus is sending. And eventually you find that these two men uh, become the leader of the church in the Acts of the Apostles. So here you find Jesus is not a tragic hero caught in events beyond his control. It's not that, okay, one day these these men came and arrested Jesus and it was not in his control and he just went with them and he just surrendered to what they were doing. No, 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 no. Jesus, in his foreknowledge, he had this knowledge. He knew what is going to happen. He knew that this suffering is important. He got to suffer. He knew that there has to be a time alone with his disciples. He got to inaugurate the new covenant. He knew all of these things. So in his foreknowledge, he's instructing the disciples to go into that city Go into that city. And he is not over there. We find Jesus, you know, Jesus' emotion, if you read in this passage, it's not a fear. He's not fearing. He's not angry. He's not being a coward. He's not saying that I do not want to face this. He, he, he's got to face this. Because that's, this is the very purpose for which Jesus was sent onto this earth. To take the sin of humanity upon himself. 
and he was all ready for it and he knew that the hour is coming the hour is at hand and jesus was ready to face that 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 suffering the precise instruction that jesus let's look at that instruction that jesus gives there first of the instruction is he sends two disciple into that city two disciple into the city which obviously gives us um, uh, a thought that they were outside of the city and i probably think they would be in bethany they were in bethany and jesus is asking these two disciples could you please go into that city into the city and find the house and then he tells he tells them that they will meet a man carrying a jar of water meet a man carrying a jar of water now this is very unusual right because in those days it was not men who used to carry the jars of water it was it it, it, it used to be women right and so this could be one of the signs where they just imagine they've been sent into the city it's kind of a sign it's kind of a sign you know it's as i said it's a busy city you got so many people now out of among them all how are you going to identify this one man so jesus is giving a sign this one man would be carrying a jar of water on his head so that could be a, a sign to you it's just like you know uh, we have monsoons coming we have monsoons these days and just imagine a man carrying um, a lady's umbrella a women's umbrella it's all pink in color <laughs> that will be quite unusual and you would be like okay he must be carrying his wife's umbrella normally they don't do it so it's kind of like that you know someone who is very unusual something unusual that is happening this man would be standing out and so he would be identifiable to peter and john i do not know how this man received communication from jesus the text doesn't say that but i somehow find a supernatural work of god it's beyond my understanding did jesus any time had any conversation with this man or arranged for everything with this man i do not know but jesus says you go into the city you will find a man carrying a jar of water it's kind of a movie when i read this passage it it it, it seems like a movie you know he's already arranged it prearranged it and then he says follow him to a specific house just go to him this man will in fact the the thing is that this man will be approaching you and you just follow him these two men follow him to a specific house now church tradition says that this house was the house of mark john mark and uh, and the master of the house was the father of mark they would not these disciples would not know what house it was up until they follow nothing of an idea where they are going all that you have to do is see the man who's carrying a jar of water just follow him just obey the instruction and once you follow him he'll take you to a specific house and that house in that house we're going to celebrate the passover and they presumably remained in that house up until jesus and rest of the team arrived in that house which i believe you know there is a reason for it had judas known that this is the house where jesus and everyone is meeting for passover he would have had a conversation with the religious leaders and would have had jesus arrested before this very hour this moment of jesus with his disciples is very precious moment he's going to spend some intimate time with his disciples giving them some instruction it is a time that is preordained by god jesus got to spend this time with his disciples and got to inaugurate this christian worship as i said the lord's supper which we which we participate in whenever we meet so all this is happening in secrecy just these two men know even these two men do not know which house this is so they just follow this man get into they got into that house and they are there and then it go, goes on to say let's look at the instruction it says tell the master of the house the teacher wants to know where my guest room is now look at the possessive pronoun there my guest room is so that he may eat the passover with my disciples my my guest room my disciples now the how it got arranged as i said it is uh, it is beyond my comprehension beyond my understanding the text doesn't guarantee or warranty us to you know come to a conclusion but it could be a supernatural work of the lord or it could also be an arrangement that is done by god 
So that was the last meal Jesus would eat before his crucifixion and was more than a usual Passover meal. In that meal, Jesus would reveal to his disciples that he is the Passover lamb. He's going to do that. And then it says, he will show you, verses 15, he'll show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. He himself, there's a reflexive pronoun there. He himself, this man, the owner of the house, himself is going to show you the room where you're going to go and prepare uh, the Passover. Normally, a slave or a servant of the house would be showing such things. But here it says, this man himself will do it. He's also a part in, in, in that process. It was a large room, that's what it says, large room, furnished, sufficient enough to accommodate these people, around 13 of them, sufficient enough for them to be accommodated. And then he says, there you will make preparation. One of the fascinating fast, uh, sorry, fact is that while the disciples are preparing the Passover feast, God himself is orchestrating this event to prepare his Passover lamb. On one hand, the disciples are preparing the Passover feast. They are slaughtering the lamb to commemorate on the deliverance from Egypt that the Israelites had. On the other hand, God above is orchestrating this event to prepare his own very son as a Passover lamb for the salvation of mankind. It is a fascinating event. Now, how is this is going to happen? How God is orchestrating this event? Through the murderous thoughts of the Jewish religious leaders. We've been looking at it. They are plotting to kill Jesus. Through the interactions of Satan, through the betrayal of Judas by his word and deed. In short, what I'm saying is that while they are preparing the Passover for Jesus, God is preparing Jesus for all of them. And for all those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as John says in John chapter 1 and verses 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. He indeed is that very final Lamb who will take the sins of the world. This is the passage as I said. Where they are recollecting their deliverance from Egypt. But from that very one day. You know we would be remembering what Jesus has done for all of us. Reflect on Jesus' detailed instruction. When I looked at Jesus' detailed instruction, how the Lord orchestrated all the situation. And as I said, it's, it's, it's kind of like a movie for me. Isn't it? You know, you will find a man, follow him, go into the house, just be there, and then these things are going to happen. It's as if one after the other, the plots are happening one after the other. Now, how does recognizing Jesus' control affect your trust in his plan? We all believe in the sovereignty of God. You and I, we believe. Every day when I wake up, I, I, this is one of the phrases that I tell my wife. I would tell her that believe in the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over all. Each and everything that happens in life, it happens under the knowledge of God. All that we've got to do is trust Trust. Keep trusting on him. And that's what is happening here. Jesus is, is, Jesus is giving a very detailed instruction, very specific instruction. And these people would have said, especially Thomas the doubter would have said, Lord, we don't find, you know, uh, we don't find uh, a very specific detail into things. You know, you're just saying you will find someone there who's carrying a pitcher and you will follow a house. Lord, there's no specifics to it. We are people who follow specifics. He, they could have said that. Peter could have said that. Lord, you are just sending us out into the city. We do not find anything. What if there's no one? I, I'm not finding any cross-questioning there. They just close their eyes and just follow the instruction that the Lord gives them. You know, when facing tasks or decisions in our own life, we got to trust that God has a plan in all of our details. Practice obedience by following what God is leading you to do, even if you don't see the whole picture. There are times when you don't see the whole picture. He just says, you know, just take the step of faith and just follow him. And we've got to do that. And there are times in life when you, you come to a juncture, you look back and you would say, God was orchestrating that event in your life. 
And I'm quite sure most of you are, who are here have come to some junctures in your life when you looked back and you would say that God was orchestrating this event in my life. When I began that journey, I couldn't see the, the, the entire picture. I couldn't see it. But I just closed my eyes and followed his instruction. I trusted in his sovereignty. And here I am, knowing that he was orchestrating these events in my life. So we find these disciples following the instructions of the Lord. Verses 16, we find the fulfillment of the instruction. They found exactly what the Lord had promised them. It, verse 16 says, the disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. Just as Jesus had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now, the disciples would have set the table with the unleavened bread. Now, there are so many elements to it. I do not have time to talk about it. But they would have set the table. They, there's unleavened bread. There's wine. There's bitter herbs. There's sauce. There's all those things as they are participating uh, in that Passover meal where they would be, uh, as I said, reflecting on the deliverance of Israelites from the Egypt, Egyptians. They also would have roasted and prepared the Passover lamb. They have to roast. Uh, it's, it's there in the Old Testament, the instructions to do it. And it, it, it clearly signified their, uh, their deliverance and redemption, uh, sorry, redemption out of Egypt. Little did these disciples know that a greater redemption is taking place. Now, as Peter and John would be preparing, setting the table, he doesn't know. They do not know. A greater lamb is going to be slaughtered in just one day from now. And he's going to take the sins of the world. He's going to provide salvation to the entire human kind. The true Christian life is a journey towards heaven in a walk of faith. When you accept Christ as your personal savior, your priorities change. Your perception changes. You are destined to heaven. You're going to go to heaven. That's what we sing. That's what we say. That's what our phrases are. You know, when we meet and greet each other, we always say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. We're looking forward to that one event where Jesus is going to come back. And so, in order to look for that, anticipating that event, it's a walk of faith. Every day you walk, you walk by faith. These disciples illustrate just that. They trusted the Lord's instruction, which was very vague. It was not detailed, as I said. It was not, in fact, specific. And as I said, it would be very odd for a man to carry the pitcher of water, but they just trusted him. And that's why the Bible says they found just like he had told them. Just like he had told them. In Psalm 23, a psalm that is familiar for all of us, we find a beautiful picture of the shepherd who takes care of the sheep. The shepherd doesn't say to the sheep, find your own path, make your own bed, fight your own fights. You're on your own. He doesn't say that. But as you look at that psalm very clearly, it says like this, it is a shepherd that leads, it's a shepherd that guides, it's a shepherd that feeds. The shepherd doesn't leave the sheep on his own and says that, you know, you've got to find food for yourself. You've got to feed yourself. I just came once and then... I'm gone. I will not be there for you. No, he doesn't say that. He takes care of the sheep. All that the sheep has got to do is to stay with the shepherd. Stay with the shepherd and be obedient to the shepherd. Where the shepherd goes, the sheep also goes with him. And he will find his food. He'll find his protection. And he will find his guidance. And we too follow the Lord. We are onwards on our, on our way heaven bound, on our way to heaven. And we got to be with the master who has said that I'm going to be with you. And in my word, I have all the instructions that you've got to do. All that you have to do is just stay around, stay, stay close to that shepherd. And he will feed us. He will guide us. He'll take care of us. He'll nourish us. As we look to him, we trust in him and we are very well taken care of. Think about those times when... You have followed God's instruction and you have found faithfulness of God in your life. Has God ever proven himself trustworthy in all of our lives? Yes. There are countless times you ask me to jot it down. I have a diary full of those instances where God revealed himself to be faithful. 
Though I couldn't see the picture at the very first go, but after a while, I could see God orchestrating those events in my life. It's always good to keep a record of your answered prayers and instances where you have seen God's faithfulness. I do not know how many of you do that, but when you pray for a certain thing and those things God answers, it's always good to note it down, jot it down. It's always good to tell your children, to tell your neighbors, to give a testimony to others that this was the prayer that I've been praying for and on this particular day, God answered my prayers. He did it. Review these, these, these notes regularly, you know, to build your trust in God's guidance and encourage others by sharing your testimonies with them. That's what we share in our testimonies. Not to uplift, uplift ourselves, but to tell others of how faithful, how good God is in our lives. So let me quickly move. Verses 17 through 21. We look at the Last Supper. So these disciples go there in that house, make preparation. How many disciples? One or two? Two disciples, two disciples. It's Peter and John. They go there, they prepare, and the rest of the band is following in verses, uh, verses 17, we find. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve while they were reclining at the table eating. Now, Mark in his gospel provides a very abbreviated account of the Passover meal than the other gospels. You find this passage, there are many cross references you find in the gospel of Luke. You also have it in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, somewhat in the gospel of John, not exactly uh, in the gospel of John. But Mark in his gospel, he wants to talk about two very significant things. One is the Lord's betrayal, how the Lord was betrayed. And the second thing that he wants to talk about is what we commonly call as the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. So these are the two things that, uh, that Mark wants to focus. And so he is having his events built around these two, two things. But the rest of the gospel writers, have they have more than these two events taking place. So between verses 17 and verses 18, now, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, it's very quick. Like verses 17, when the evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. And verses 18, when they were reclining at the table. But if you look at the Gospel of John, chapter 13, there you have a big event about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and teaching them about a lesson on humility. He talks to them about what a servant leadership is all about. He says the true leaders are truly in the business of serving others. So, as I said, you've got to look at each of the Gospels from the vantage point they would, would want us to know the things. So, here in the Gospel of Mark, Mark wants us to know about the betrayal of Jesus and also wants to know about the Lord's table or the Last Supper. The text says like this, while they were reclining at the table, last week also we looked at, that is the customary position of their sitting uh, for, 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 for eating their meals. Now, it's not like uh, we who gathered around a central table and we would have one person. Normally, in our, in our tradition, I do not know what happens here in, uh, in, in, in North, but back in South, you have one seat placed for the head of the house. Nobody dares to sit there. And if some kids go and sit there, you make them stand and go, or, or go to some other seat because this seat is reserved for the head of the house. Isn't it? I, I, that takes place in the south. I do not know in the north uh, if that's the custom that they follow. So uh, there in the, in, the, in the ancient Near East, they do not have this custom, but they used to recline at the table. It was just you've got to sit and recline at the table. You have one of your hands here, and then your, your, your feet is uh, pointed towards the head of the other man, just like last week I told. Uh, that's why they had this custom of washing the feet. You've got to wash the feet because you walk down through the desert and your feet will be full of dust. And so you wash the feet so that it won't be distracting to the person sitting next to you. So kind of, you know, taking care, taking up, or having the other person in, in your consideration. So while they were reclining at the table, a normal posture for having meal in that day, Jesus utters some words that would have shocked these disciples. Now they are gathering there for a Passover meal. They are gathering there to celebrate. They had asked, Lord, where do you want us to celebrate? Everyone is celebrating. Lord, let us also celebrate. So they are gathering there. Jesus gathered all of them. You know, Jesus knows. Jesus knows in his foreknowledge. He knows that he's going to suffer. Here you have 
the very moment Jesus would be uttering some words that would be like a bombshell dropped into that group. And he's going to say this. And he, he, he sends a cold chill running around in that room when he says that word, when he says those phrases. They never expected such a phrase from Jesus. He announces that one of the numbers is going to betray him in the hands of the Jews. Verses 18 and the B part. Let me read that for all, all of us. He said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. Just imagine. We're all seated here and I say that one of you is going to betray me. It's like a bombshell. And I'm telling that one of you is going to take me to, to the court. Now the obvious question you would be asking is, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? I never, I never had that kind of a conversation with him. I never plotted against him. These kind of thoughts would come into you. And this is what exactly is happening. And Jesus is, you know, like a bombshell, he's, 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 he's putting that in that room. And he says, one of you is going to betray me. These words, one of you must have stunned the disciples. You've got to understand the uh, custom in the Middle East. Because to betray a friend and eating a meal with him was still regarded as a worst kind of treachery. You know, worst kind of betrayal. You betray a friend and you're not even letting him know you are, you are sharing a meal with him. One of my cousins work in, in army and he's an officer in the army. So I got to spend some time with him. So one fine day, he had uh, some of his juniors uh, eating food with him. And I was like, okay, that's a nice, nice gesture. You know, officer is having food with the junior officers and they were having food. The next day, I hear my cousin shouting on the phone, very angry. And he was at the top of his voice, just like somebody would roar and he was roaring. And I, was, I got a bit scared and I just went away and I asked his wife, like, who is he shouting at? You know, the answer that I got was the very friends with whom he was sharing his meal the previous day. And I was like, okay, you were sharing no meal. You were so friendly the other day and the next day, you know. You're just being so angry as if they were the, your worst enemies. In the Middle East, if you share a meal with someone, you wouldn't dare to betray that person because you are committed in a relationship or in a fellowship with that person. To eat bread is a token of loyalty, is a token of devotion, is a token of love. And Jesus says, one of you who is sharing a meal with me is going to betray me very soon. Verses 19. They were saddened and one by one they said to him, surely you do not mean me? Now our Lord's words must have provoked grief in them, soul searching in them. They were searching their own souls as they should. They were so sorrowful and they asked each other, is it I, is it I? You know, from one by one, that's what the text says. One after the other, they are asking him, is it I? One wonders what this shocking news would have brought to their appetites. They're going to have a wonderful meal. The Passover lamb is set, all roasted, grilled. You're going to have it. And then you get this shocking news that one of you is going to betray me. Just imagine, if you and I were in that position, I wouldn't even be able to digest the food that is going in. I would be saying, I don't want to eat. It's so tasteless. The Greek of that phrase, it expects a negative answer. Is it I? And it expects a negative answer. No, no, it's not you. Is it I? No, it's not you. Is it I? No, it's not you. Everybody, one by one, they're asking. But in Matthew chapter 26, verses 25, you find Judas also asked the same question. Is it I, Lord? When I read that, I couldn't imagine a man who walked with Jesus for three long years didn't even know that Jesus knew who exactly it was who was going to betray him. The one who walked on the water, the one who multiplied food with, with little bread and fish, gave to the thousands, the one who raised the dead alive, that one 
has the knowledge about who is going to betray him. Judas, in his hypocrisy, is again asking, Lord, is it I? Had Jesus pointed out to Jesus, uh, sorry, Judas that day, I'm quite sure Peter would have choked him to death. Isn't it? Peter would have said, you dare not survive. Because you are going to betray our master with whom we walked. Verses 20. Now Jesus is narrowing down the clues. They were, I, I, I suppose they were uh, in that house, they, they would be the master, the slave of the house. There were many people uh, apart from these 12. So now Jesus is narrowing down the list. He says, it is one of the 12. Please do not look at the slave of the house or the master of the house. It is one of these 12, the 12 that you are seated here. One of you is going to betray me. One who, again he goes on to say, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. His most trusted and intimate companions for whom he came to this earth, spent his life. One of them is going to betray. We all know we are... We are known to the information that it was Judas, but they in that room, they didn't know who it was. It was an opportunity given to Judas to confess, to confess. But we know. What strikes me so amazing is that Judas did not confess. He had a great opportunity to let go of his thoughts. Now, you may have so many questions. Judas was destined to do this. No, no, Judas was not destined to do this. Yes, it could be done by anyone. He was not a robot in the hand of God that you are the one, Judas, you were born for this. No, no, he was not born for this. No, no, not at all. But he had opportunities to repent. What great an opportunity, what greater opportunity will you receive when the master himself is saying, one of you, one among these 12 will betray me. Judas knew the kindness of God. He knew the character of God. You know, the woman that came to Jesus, a sinner who came to Jesus, many people accused him, uh, accused the woman. And Jesus said, who among you is without sin can stone her first. He knew the kindness of God, the forgiveness of God. He knew the act of love that Jesus has. What an act of friendship. Jesus is giving Judas a time, a moment again. One more chance, Judas, one more chance you have. One more chance, here you go, one more chance you have. Repent. Repent. Come back to me, turn to me. Just like when Boaz invited Ruth to do the same. Boaz, in the Old Testament, he said to Ruth, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. Judas, come here, eat with me. Here is my friendship, here is your forgiveness. If you take it, will you? Will you accept my friendship? Will you accept my forgiveness? The text says, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. The Satan entered him. How can Satan enter into a person who walked with Jesus for three long years? The heart of Judas is the heart of all of us seated here. The heart of Judas is the heart that I also have apart from the grace of God. If there is no grace of God, you and I also would be responding in the same manner. You and I would say, I would want to betray Jesus. And we betrayed him so many times had it not been for the grace of God. And the only way and the only reason that the heart is, that our heart is open to receive the truth is the spirit of God that dwells in you and the spirit of God that dwells in me. The Spirit of God tells me, prompts me, this is not the way, this is not the path. I got to turn back. I got to follow Jesus. I got to obey Him. It's the Spirit of God that dwells inside of us, convicts us of the sin that we commit and tells us that you are a sinner. But Judas didn't obey. Judas didn't have the guts to repent. It's the Spirit of God that's there inside of us that gives us understanding, that gives us a new desire to follow Jesus. 
I always thank God for the Spirit of God that God has deposited in me. Had it not been for the Spirit of God, I, I would be walking the walk of destruction, headed for eternal destruction. For every sin that I commit, I would be so happy committing those sins. And I would be so happy, contented in my life, would be saying that I have had it enough, I've, I'm having everything in my life. I would have said that had it not been for the Spirit of God convicting me and telling me, you are a sinner. Praise be to God for God depositing His Spirit inside of us. In a painful sense, the answer of the question of the betrayer of verses 20, is it I, requires an answer, yes, from each one of us. Yes, it is me. It is me who is betraying the Lord. Yes, Judas betrayed Jesus. Yes, definitely he did that. But you know what? By morning, every one of them betrayed Jesus. Isn't it? We are all very quick to condemn Judas. Judas, it was good if you would have repented. But how about you or Peter? You had moments, you had chances. Where you just denied even knowing the Lord and you just ran away. The others betrayed Jesus for greed. Some betrayed him from weaknesses and cowardice. How about you? How about me? What about us? Is there any areas in our life where we, we are betraying Jesus? Through our actions, our inactions. It's always good to examine our own lives and, uh, and check Praise be to God for, the, as I said, the Spirit of God inside of us, clearly telling us where we go wrong. Confess and repent of those areas where you have fallen short. Repent. Repent. For the time is at hand when Jesus is going to come back. He gives us moments and moments, moments after moments to repent, come back to Him, turn back to Him. That's what His love is all about. But we do not know how many moments do we get to repent Judas had all his chances to repent let me close verses 23, 22 to 26 this sacred meal the Lord's Supper it is recorded in all of the three synoptic gospels gospel of Matthew, Luke but not the gospel of John it has been called as the last supper, the Lord's Supper the communion, the Lord's table and so on and so forth the Eucharist Bread and wine were the two common elements that usually were uh, there in every meal. But now Jesus is giving a wonderful new meaning to it. From now on, the memorial will not be the memorial on the deliverance from Egypt. But from now on, it will be a memorial of his death, of his love. Every detail of the Passover pointed to that great deliverance of Israelites from Egypt. But now Jesus will redirect all those details to himself and to his deliverance of the world from sin. He says, when you do it again, do this in, in what? In remembrance of me. Do not do this in remembrance of your deliverance from Egypt. No, do this in remembrance of me. So he took the bread. Let me quickly move. Verses 22. And while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, Take it. This is my body. Yes, this bread represents the life of Christ. His birth. He was given a body at Bethlehem in which he was born at his birth. Bethlehem is known as the house of bread and his, also his life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, a sinless, sinless life that he led in that body. On, on the cross, he took all of our sins on that cross in his body. His resurrection, he triumphed from the grave, bringing that body back to life. His ascension, he's living in that glorified body at the right hand of the Father. Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body in remembrance of me. He who was God did not consider him equal with God, but came and humbled himself as a man and lived like a man so that you and I can share with him. Take, eat, this is my body. And then verses 23, he takes...
the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This blood did what the blood of the animals couldn't do. The blood of the animals only covered the sin, but this blood took away all of our sins. It just didn't cover the sins. In the Old Testament, when the animal's blood was sacrificed or the animal's blood was there, it just used to cover, just a cover. We are not saved by participating in a religious ceremony, but we are saved by trusting Jesus Christ as our, as our Savior. And we can truly say along with, uh, along with others, along with the disciples and the early church, yes, I am really forgiven. My sins are not just covered, my sins are taken away, and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. Praise be to God that I am able to participate in that Passover lamb that was, that was shed or that was, that was laid for me. Verses 25. The supper that ends in a, in, in a, in a, in a positive hope. Verses 25. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the wine until the day when I drink it in new in the kingdom of God. A very hope, a very bright hope. Looking forward to the second coming. Right now I face suffering, right now I face death. But one day I'll be reunited with him in heaven. Life is full of suffering, yes. You're a righteous man, you're an unrighteous, you will go through suffering. We, we've got to go through that. But our eternal hope, our bright hope that makes us moving is that one day we're going to be reunited with him, celebrating that Passover lamb that died on the cross for me. Verses 26. And we close. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They sung a hymn. Imagine the Lord singing when the cross was only a few hours away from him. I, could, I cannot imagine that. You're going to die. Tomorrow is your death. You're going to die. Jesus was sure of two things. He was to die and the kingdom was going to come. He was certain of the cross. The cross he cannot avoid. But he was also certain of the glory that was awaiting him. He was certain of the love of the Father. He knew that the Father would never leave him. He was so precious to the Father. But he was also certain of the sins of the humanity. He had to die. He was certain that in the end, that love would conquer all. And that's what it did. This morning, I want to conclude how great a God we serve. The Passover lamb that died for you and me has made us members of the new covenant community. You and I, we are members of the new covenant community. We participate in the table of the Lord. Let us live this reality by practicing forgiveness, extending grace and fostering unity within the body of Christ. Live with that eternal perspective. We are bound to heaven, as I always say, bound to heaven. Make your daily decisions in the perspective of the return of the Lord. He's going to come back. And your daily decisions would be focused with that perspective and prioritize spiritual growth. Invest in relationships. Invest in fellowships. You've got to have brotherly or Christian brothers and sisters. You've got to have brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Invest in those kind of relationships and fellowships. Engage in those acts of service that has eternal significance. All that you do to the least of these brothers, Jesus says, you do it unto me. Invest in those kinds of service. Let's all close our eyes. Let us introspect our lives before the word that has come to us this morning. Judas had received so many chances to, to repent and come back to the Lord, but he didn't. Church, we have so many chances to repent and come back to the Lord. Take the moment and confess our sins. Let us be grateful and thankful for this new identity we have received in Christ Jesus, participants of the new new covenant. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and reverence. We thank you for the profound truths revealed in your word today. As we reflect on the Last Supper and the incredible sacrifice of Lord Jesus, we are reminded of your unfailing love and the new covenant established through the blood of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you help us to trust in your sovereignty in all aspects of our lives, just as the disciples trusted Jesus' instructions. May we seek your guidance in every decision and the step we take, knowing that you have a perfect plan for all of us. Forgive us, Father, for the times we have betrayed your trust through our actions, through our inactions. Help us to examine our hearts regularly and turn away from anything that separates us from your love. Give us the strength to remain faithful and obedient even in the face of challenges and temptations that we face on the everyday basis of our lives. Lord, we are looking forward to that one day where we'll participate anew with you in your kingdom. Until then, keep our hearts steadfast and our eyes fixed on Jesus. May our lives be a testimony of your love and your redemption, bringing glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, our Passover lamb, we pray. Amen.